So thank you, Mr. Pride, for um, agreeing to this interview. I want to go um, a little bit back uh, into the history when you were appointed sure. and you came to Ukraine right. in 2013. And do you remember what you told me at the time? <laughs> what did I tell you? <laughs> you said, don't ignore the issue of press freedom in Ukraine. <laughs> That's good. That's good. You don't. It was good <laughs> advice. But still, like when you came, uh, you were probably not expecting uh, big turmoil, uh, but you came and it did. What, how, what was your feeling when you came to the country? Well, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody could have imagined the changes and the drama that Ukraine has been through over the past two years. You know, the 21st of November will be the second year anniversary of the beginning of all of this. Um, you know, I think there were periods of enormous sadness, but also inspiring courage. Uh, you know, ultimately, it's about the Ukrainian people. I think back on the Maidan, you know, I will remember the first time I heard before it was public uh, that Yanukovych was not going to sign the association agreement. And I remember a conversation at that point with Sergei Lubochkin, and I asked Sergei, I said, you know, how are you going to explain this to the people of Ukraine? Um, what's the, what's the, the diplomacy plan? He said, I don't know. Um, and I think ultimately, you know, that's the story of the Maidan. It was about Yanukovych trying to deny the choice that the Ukrainian people had made to move towards European institutions and European values. Was it exactly Yanukovych or maybe it was a bigger push from Russia? I don't know. I mean, I think you have to ask Viktor Yanukovych that question. He's the only one who knows. Um, I know there were a lot of people around the presidential administration in those days who were just as surprised as we were by the decision that Yanukovych made. Um, you know, I will tell you in my initial conversations with President Yanukovych after I arrived in, in August, he was all talking about the intention to take Ukraine towards Europe, towards European values. So four months and... No, and it, it, that was what, you know, I think that's what was the spark for the Maidan. Everybody in this country, 46 million people thought, we're going to Europe. And then all of a sudden, in late November, he announces, change of plans, we're actually going to the Eurasian Customs Union, I've changed my mind. I've had a conversation with Vladimir Putin, but ultimately what was going on in his mind, I think only, only Viktor Yanukovych will know. So what did you tell uh, Washington uh, back then when uh, first people came on, on Maidan? Oh, you, boy. You realized that this is like serious. Well, it was very clear it was big. And again, I remember people around the government telling me this is bigger than the Orange Revolution. It's much deeper. Um, and you know, I remember walking around Kyiv those first days. I mean, I was out walking on, on St. Michael's on Mikhailiska on the morning of, I guess it would have been November 30th, December 1st, right after this all started. Um, you know, and it wasn't, you know, this was not, this was a popular demonstration. It was, you know, I remember it was so striking to me the, the number of strollers that you saw and people with young children and people with their grandmothers. Um, you know, and these were people who were demanding a say in their country's future. Um, you know, the, the Maidan itself then went through this extraordinary 11 weeks. Um, there were the events in the first week of December. Remember, that was during the OSCE, uh, the OSCE ministerial. Um, you had the, all of Europe was here, all of these foreign ministers, but it was also the time when Yanukovych and Bankova chose first to send the Berkut against the demonstrators to, to try to clear Maidan and all the violence there, and yet people came back. You know, I remember that evening, um, I was woken up um, by a phone call. Um, I won't say who it was from, but let's just say it was from somebody who's now very prominent in the government. The who, Ukrainian government. In the Ukrainian government, who called me up to say, um, Ambassador, they're, they're, they've sent the Berkut and they're trying to clear the Maidan. And what I remember from my house in Podil, I could hear the church bells ringing. You could hear the bells of, of St. Sophia and St. Michael's were being rung. And as we watched this over the evening, watching it, this bizarre experience of watching it on the live stream, watching it on TV, and then and hearing that, there, and, and sort of hearing what was going on, we were observers. But uh, what was striking to me was the crowd was getting bigger. You know, people were coming out. And I think that's, you know, that's the essence of the sort of the courage that was demonstrated throughout throughout the Maidan, I think, you know, and frankly, the courage that Ukrainians have demonstrated over this extraordinary 20 months. You know, Vladimir Putin underestimated the Ukrainian people. Still, uh, back in Washington, did Washington understand what's really going on? Did Europe understood really what's going on? I think we, we certainly understood how 
strong the demand was among Ukrainian people to stay on the path to Europe. Do you remember there was a very strong statement that Secretary of State Kerry issued that night um, when the, in the first week of December when the Berkut were first sent onto the Maidan. Uh, he expressed, I think he used the word disgust, disgusted by, yes. by what was happening, um, which is a strong word for a statement from the Secretary of State. Um, but throughout this period, we were also very strong, and I, I was coordinating very closely with Ambassador Tombinsky, my EU counterpart, Ambassador Weil, my German counterpart, all of whom are close friends and are still here. But we were all saying the same thing. Nonviolence, work through Ukrainian constitutional structures, support democracy, support the values that you say you stand for. Um, then again, war yeah. started and Russia would not give up and uh, it's clearly not giving up even now. What was your expectation and how, um, uh, how was Ukrainian government ready to actually fight the war and did you have a clear picture uh, uh, about Ukrainian readiness to really fight the war? Gosh, I mean, that's, that's a hard question. I mean, first I will say what will stick with me was that first Sunday after Yanukovych fled. And one of my Ukrainian friends who's now in the Rada, uh, she said to me, she said, you know, that was our one weekend of happiness. Um, but what before I- Before the war. Before uh, the war, yeah, after, after Yanukovych had left. So it would have been 22nd, 23rd, I guess the morning of the tw Sunday the 23rd. Remember the Rada was in session because they had voted with overwhelming support, including from Party of Regions representatives, uh, to declare Yanukovych um, uh, failing, that he had failed to discharge his responsibilities as president. But what I will remember is, and this was totally unexpected for me, I went on that Sunday morning, I went to the Rada to go see um, Turchinov, who at that point was speaker. and. Um, we were coming up Rushevskoho, um, actually the back way because the road was still not open from my house. And I was, you know, head down reading my Blackberry in the back of the car and all of a sudden we stopped and I looked at it. We were just, we were just by, um, just by the hotel there, like by the, the entrance to Marinsky Park. We weren't at the Rada yet. And I was thinking, well, why are we stopping now? And the whole street was full. And again, it was full of, you know, grandmothers, families, people with strollers, coming with flowers, coming with candles. Um, and I realized they were reclaiming their democracy. They were coming to the Rada. Because, and you know, there was a sense of, now we're going to hold these people responsible. Now we have, to, we have to build a new country. That was a profoundly inspiring period. Um, you know, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk was named a few days later. Um, he tells the story now. He arrived in office and he discovered that Ukraine had a few thousand dollars left in the treasury. The, the cupboard was bare. Um, as he used to say, you know, an army that couldn't fight, an air force that wouldn't fly, a navy that didn't float. Um, so, you know, Ukraine was at its weakest from a military standpoint. That's when Putin moved into, into Crimea. You know, I will always remember, you know, those first few days after the little green men showed up and, you know, people were trying to figure, what's going on here? Because it was so inconceivable that Putin would blow up international norms so dramatically that he would violate the, the principle of territorial integrity that had been so important to preserving peace since the Second World War. It's the most, the most um, sacred principle of the Euro-Atlantic security community. So that's why the United States um, kind of pushed for a special international coalition to support Ukraine. When that decision to actually, the United States took the lead to, to help Ukraine. Well, it was, it was very again. clear after the, uh, you know, after we recognized that Putin was, had sent troops into Crimea, that the annexation was underway, and even before the Kremlin ceremony where they announced all of this. Um, it was clear that the United States was going to take the lead in terms of international sanctions. It was also very clear to us that Russia's aggression would have to be met through non-military instruments, that our strongest levers were going to be economic pressure, and most importantly, the solidarity of the international community and with our European partners. And I think that's an area where, again, Putin badly underestimated our ability to maintain unity um, with the EU and the other key players in the G7. And there's a lot of uh, uh, format of this international uh, coalition discussion, Minsk, Nor Normandy, uh, Geneva. How those formats formed uh, back then and why uh, United States uh, kind of dropped out of the 
discussion between Russia, France, uh, Germany. Yeah, I don't think it's fair to say that we've dropped out. Maybe and, you not. Know, and President Obama deserves enormous credit, I think, for the work that he has done, retail-level diplomacy with his European counterparts. Lots of time on the phone with Chancellor Merkel, with Hollande, with Renzi, with all of our European partners to make sure that the core principle was upheld. Um, you know, I can't put it any better than President Obama did in his UN General Assembly speech a few weeks ago. You know, we did not have a lot of immediate economic interests here in Ukraine, but the principles are very important to us. And, and the president, the White House, the administration took a very strong position in response. You know, a lot of the formats subsequent to that, I think people sometimes underestimate how accidental some of these diplomatic arrangements can be. A lot That's why I'm asking a you. A lot <laughs> depends on the calendar and who's, happening, who's meeting with who. Remember, we had the Geneva format exactly. for a while, which was mm -hmm. Secretary Kerry mm -hmm. and, and Lavrov. Then you have the Normandy format. And remember, the Normandy meeting itself happened right after the first meeting between President Poroshenko and, and uh, President Obama, even before Poroshenko was sworn in. Um, President Obama met with him in Warsaw at the Solidarity anniversary. Um, and that was a couple of days before Normandy. And of course, the President was very closely coordinating with Hollande and Merkel around all of that. So not to overlook how much this, these formats depend on who happens to be seeing who on which day of the week. But the important thing, the United States has been deeply engaged from day one and I think has played to our strength which is our ability to mobilize an international coalition. Do you think that if the United States would be uh, in uh, direct discussions or on, at one of those formats, the Ukrainian position would be stronger? I don't think so. Uh, you know, I, I think um, we found a good balance right now. And of course, we've had direct conversations with the Russians, um, Secretary Kerry with President Putin in Sochi back in the summer, the work that Assistant Secretary Newland has done with Karasin. So it's not like we're not engaged in this. And, but we're also, of course, coordinating closely with our European partners. And then most importantly, I think the work that we do to help make Ukraine stronger. So I'm enormously proud of what we're doing at, uh, at Yavariv and what we've done with security sector assistance. We've got our, our loan guarantees. We'll have Secretary of Treasury Liu here tomorrow um, to continue our economic partnership. Did President Poroshenko ask you to participate in the discussion? I mean, what was his request? I mean, the, the president and his, you know, both the president and the prime minister have been very clear in wanting American engagement. Mm -hmm. And they've gotten that. Remember, prime minister, um, it would have been the middle of March. So just a couple of weeks after Yanukovych fled when Prime Minister Yatsenyuk had his first meeting with President Obama in the Oval Office. Um, president Poroshenko, a couple of weeks after his his inauguration flew to Washington for that extraordinary joint session of Congress. So we've been, we've been engaged here. Um, I think you know, the Ukrainian government wants to see us, as it wants to see the United States as closely engaged as possible. The most important principle for President Poroshenko is unity. We're constantly saying to the Ukrainians, we need unity among the democratic forces, unity between the prime minister and the president. President Poroshenko says back to us, we need unity between the United States and Europe. It's a very important principle for Ukraine because they realize that that's part of Putin's objective. It's to split the West. Uh, I want to ask you one more question on the international uh, kind of side uh, about Budapest Memorandum. Ukraine gave up uh, nuclear weapons. All those uh, rockets were turned to United States. It was a big danger for United States. Uh, signed the agreement. Uh, do you think that international community and United States fulfilled that uh, agreement? Russia is in flagrant violation of the obligation it undertook as a signatory of the Budapest Memorandum to respect Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. That's clear. Through its invasion and annexation of Crimea and then its move into Donbas, Russia has done enormous damage to international security norms and it has also damaged the principle of security assurances that were represented by the Budapest Memorandum. That's one of the reasons the United States has worked so hard to support Ukraine, precisely because Ukraine had played this courageous role. All that being said, I don't think nuclear weapons would have changed Ukraine's situation, and in a lot of ways it would have made this crisis much more complicated. I think, uh, you know, you mentioned that you had, you, you had met earlier with Ukraine's first president, and, and I think you know, President Kravchuk, 
I've had some fascinating conversations with him about those, those weeks mm -hmm. and the conversations he had with President Clinton, um, with Deputy Secretary, then Deputy Secretary Talbot, um, Rose Gottmuller, all of whom are people, in the case of Rose, who remain part of our administration, deeply engaged on Ukraine issues. And they recognize the wisdom that Ukraine's first independent leadership demonstrated in making that decision. Let's uh, now talk about uh, what happened after Maidan and what we see right now in, in Ukrainian government. Um, not many people satisfied with the uh, pass of the reforms right now. Uh, how would you assess the, 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 the reform agenda? You know, I, I, it's, this is a classic, is the glass half full mm -hmm. or half empty? And I'm a glass half full person. You know, first of all, not to overlook all that Ukraine has accomplished. Um, it's had good elections, um, especially the election for president, the election for the new Rada, conducted under difficult circumstances, meeting the highest democratic standards. Ukraine has made significant process in a couple of key areas of reform. Um, I am a huge fan of uh, Governor Hontoreva and what the NBU, the central bank, has done to clean up the banking sector. About a third of Ukraine's banks have been shut down because they were non-performing, uh, significant moves against related party lending, giving Ukrainians and Ukrainian business confidence in the financial sector, real progress in the energy sector, cutting out the middlemen, getting out people like Firtash, um, creating a more transparent energy market, and most importantly, reducing Ukraine's dependence on Russia as a gas supplier. You have defused the gas weapon that Russia has used for two decades to deny Ukraine strategic choices. And then all the incredible work that's been done by Ukrainian civil society in the Rada to change the rules of the game, whether financial disclosure, freedom of information, transparency of media ownership, public disclosure of property titles, all of these very technical steps that make it impossible to go back to Yanukovych-style governance in Ukraine. So these are all important steps. People want more. There's no question in my mind what the single most important deficit of progress has been, and that's in the area of anti-corruption, building confidence in the courts, building confidence in the prosecutor's office and in the legal system. There's huge amounts of work to do there. And it's not something that is going to be solved from one day to the next, but it's an area where Ukrainians demand to see progress. You know, I, I like the way Slava Vakarchuk put it in his comments in Washington <laughs> earlier this week. He said, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day, but Ukraine is making progress. And again, it's precisely because Ukrainians are demanding higher standards that I'm confident the system is going to change. One other point I would make, not to be overlooked, uh, you've beaten Putin. You know, when this whole crisis began, when the troops first came into Donbass in March and April of 2014, the Kremlin wanted most of Ukraine. It wanted Novorossiya, it wanted Odessa, it wanted Kharkiv. That's never going to happen. What the Kremlin is left with right now Russia and its proxies have this tiny little corner of, of Donbass, and you need to get that back, and we will work with you to get that back. But the rest of Ukraine has made its choice, and I don't see it ever going back. You think these uh, moves are unreversible? So the Russia, Russia would not try to actually go forward and still uh, manipulate the situation? I think Putin holds the switch. Uh, it's very clear that the Kremlin has complete control over these military operations. That's why the ceasefire, which, remember, was signed in September 2014, finally came into effect in September 2015, because the Kremlin made a decision to shift the focus to busy itself in Syria. But the military force remains. You have a very large army, tens of thousands of soldiers, trained and equipped by the Russian Federation with more tanks and artillery and rockets and armor than many NATO countries. And it hasn't gone anywhere. Exactly. You know, and that's where the Minsk agreement comes in. And, and they're that, not fulfilling it. They are not fulfilling it. Uh, the only area of the Minsk agreement that has so far been implemented by Russia and its separatist proxies, and even that imperfectly, is the ceasefire. Mm -hmm. That took 12 months. And you see in the past still week, fighting. they're still fighting. Um, and we've been very clear about that. And fortunately, uh, you know, Chancellor Merkel has been very clear as well that the Minsk agreement is not a, you know, it's not a, a smorgasbord that you can choose certain things from. It's a set of obligations, obligations which President Putin himself signed on to in 
February of 2015. And as Chancellor Merkel always reminds, the, the September 2014 obligations are part of the larger package, and that's the standard that Russia needs to be held to. Uh, what is next for Ukraine? Uh, I mean, in the immediate uh, future, what do you, what are you hoping for? Ukraine? You're supposed to answer that question. <laughs> no, no, you are the ambassador. I know my, my answer. <laughs> no, well, you know, for this is for Ukrainians to decide. It really is. Um, you know, I think, you know, there is a hard, there's a lot of hard work that lies ahead. Um, again, from an American standpoint, from the perspective of a sympathetic outside observer, the most important area that needs work now is the justice system, how to build confidence in the courts, in the prosecutor, in a way that the Ukrainian people themselves will respect. And I know that's possible because we've seen what's happened with the patrol police, which is such a fantastic success and Ukrainians are justifiably proud of that. You know, I was meeting today actually with Minister Avakov and the, the new head of the patrol police, Katya, who, um, you know, these are people who have a sense of vision and they, they recognize that this is about changing the system changing the patterns and moving towards European standards. That's what the United States is going to support, and I know that's what our European partners are going to support. But ultimately, as I've said in some of my speeches, you can't just improve the police. You can't just improve the National Guard. You can't just improve the Army. You've also got to build the other pillar of rule of law, which is the courts and the justice system. Um, I am very encouraged by what's been happening in the RADA with these constitutional reforms, and I, I think the president and his team at Bankova deserve great credit for the positive evaluation that they won from the Venice Commission. But the most encouraging thing for me is the fact that there's actually consensus. This is an issue that Ukrainian civil society, all the members of the governing coalition, and I think even opposition bloc, can get behind this principle of reform to the judicial system because everybody knows, you know, courts. Have, what, the, this you know, is the building block. It's a fundamental building block, and it is what has caused so many deformities in Ukrainian politics in the past. You know, as as I've said before, this is the best chance Ukraine is ever going to have to build the kind of democratic European future that the Ukrainian people deserve and which Ukrainians thought they were going to get after independence, but were thwarted from for two decades. Every uh, single uh, U.S. ambassador who spent time in Ukraine uh, became a big lobbyist for yeah. Ukraine in the end. What, <laughs> how would you, what do you expect from yourself? Oh do gosh, you I don't even, I, you know, I, I, Miroslava, I, <laughs> I, I do my job one week at a time, and I have given no thought at all to, to the long-term future. Um, it's been a source of great encouragement and uh, benefit to me that, as you say, you know, all of my predecessors have remained engaged, many of them in Washington. Um, I think that reflects, first of all, you know, just how compelling this country's story is. You know, Ukraine, if you look around the world, if you were going to give a prize to a country which got a raw deal out of the 20th century, Ukraine is pretty high on that list. But now there's a sense that they're building something fundamentally, fundamentally different, and we want to support that. Um, you know, I think all of my predecessors, first of all, I, I met with every single one of them before I came out here. Um, and none of them told me, none of them predicted what was going to happen, so that makes me feel a little better. Um, but they've all said as well that, you know, this is a country um, which has such a compelling history, such a strong sense of cultural identity, and which deserves much better than it's gotten in the past. Thank you so much for your work and uh, Slava Ukraini. Slava Ukraini. Great to see you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Miroslav. Thank you so much.